stories are the most powerful thing on earth. They are literally life and death. Wars are waged based on the story of who is the hero and who is the villain. You are the result of a story your parents told each other. The one night stand, the soulmate, and friends who became so much more. Life and death. So wouldn't you like to understand them better, these stories? How Story Works, an elegant guide to the crafts of storytelling by Lonnie Diane Rich, demystifies stories and helps you understand why you love what you love, why you hate what you hate, and why prologues are almost always a bad idea. How Story Works by Lonnie Diane Rich. Available on Amazon in ebook, audiobook, and paperback form. Get your copy today. Welcome to Still Pretty, a Buffy the Vampire Slayer podcast from Chipperish Media. I'm story expert and unemployed librarian with a tendency to get knocked on the head, Lonnie Diane Rich. And I'm film scholar Noelle LaCroix, and I don't know if I'm driving this thing or wearing it. And we're here today to talk about A New Man, the 12th episode of season four. A New Man aired on January 25th, 2000 and was written by Jane Espenson and directed by Michael Gershman. As you know, as we know, we are a fully spoiled Buffy Rewatch podcast. We've seen it. You've seen it. We can talk about anything we want to because it's our podcast. (laughs) And I'm just supposed to help you out of the evilness of my heart? Oh, whatever. Let's just go on patrol. In A New Man, Buffy and Riley are making out when Willow interrupts with a crisis. They rush out, but it turns out it's a surprise party for Buffy's birthday. No demons attack, which makes it a new experience for everyone. But Giles is left feeling a little out of place, especially when Buffy starts gushing about Professor Walsh. You should meet her. She's absolutely the smartest person I've ever met. Perhaps we should have invited Professor Walsh to the party. Oh, no. I mean... She's like 40. She's got better things to do than hang out with a bunch of kids. Meanwhile, Spike is moving out of Xander's basement, and Buffy is meeting with Professor Walsh, who condescends to her while bragging that Riley has taken down 17 hostiles. Wow. I mean, that's... 17. Walsh then asks Buffy about her number, and since this is a sexual number analog, and Walsh is a Riley's mom analog, all of this is weird and uncomfortable, so let's cut to Giles, please. At his apartment, Giles is cleaning when he realizes the demon prince Bavane is rising that night and he must stop it. He goes to see Professor Walsh looking for Buffy and Professor Walsh is an asshole to him because she's an asshole to everyone because she's an asshole. (laughs) I think it can be unhealthy to take on adult roles too early. What I suspect I'm seeing is a reaction to the absence of a male role model. Absence? Buffy clearly lacks a strong father figure. I'm sorry, I have things to do. I'll tell Buffy her friend was looking for her. Willow and Xander go with Giles to the crypt, and while they wait for the demon prince, they tell him that Riley and the commandos probably already took care of it. Also, Riley's a commando, part of the initiative. Also, it's called the initiative. Also, Anya knows. And Spike. And Maggie Walsh is the head of it. Giles sends them away, then leaves himself, and Ethan Rain steps out of the shadows to evil monologue for a bit, but then Giles hears him and comes back in. They fight for a bit, but then Ethan convinces him to go have a drink while he tells him what's up. Ethan tells him that there's something out there getting the demon world all freaked out. Something called 314. This does nothing to make Giles feel more relevant. 20 years I've been fighting demons. Why are you Walton, Hannah? Nancy and Ninja Boys come in. Six months later, demons are pissing themselves with fear. They never even noticed me. Buffy and Riley spar in the gym, and he tells her not to hold back, and she holds back a little less and sends him flying across the room, as is only proper and appropriate. In Tara's room, Willow and Tara are doing spells, and the spell goes kerflooey, making Willow think that there's some kind of weird magical mojo interfering. The next morning, Giles wakes up, only he's not Giles. He's a demon with horns and scaly skin and everything. He trashes his apartment, unused to his new demonic strength, and goes to see Xander, who doesn't recognize or understand him. Demon! Demon! 
Everyone rushes to Giles's to tell him about the thing that attacked Xander, but they find his place all torn apart. But no blood, so at least maybe Giles isn't dead. Meanwhile, Giles wanders through the graveyard, dejected, when Spike comes up on him, delighted that he's found a demon, something he can kill. Giles mutters to himself, figuring that Spike can't understand him. But, as it turns out... Giles, go on then, let's get on with the fighting. You understand me? Of course I understand you. I'm speaking English? No, you're speaking Fioral. I happen to speak Fioral. And, by the way, why the hell are you suddenly a Fioral demon? Spike agrees to help Giles, for money, but Giles doesn't want him to tell Buffy. He just wants to find Ethan Rain and have him reverse the spell without ever involving Buffy at all. But back at Giles' place, Buffy and the gang are deep in research mode trying to figure out what happened to Giles. Riley shows up reporting that there were a bunch of 911 calls about a demon on the loose. Riley promises to help find Giles. Meanwhile, Spike is driving Giles' car as they look for Ethan Rain, and the Fioral is taking over Giles' personality, making him more aggressive. He sees Maggie Walsh walking on the street and makes Spike stop the car so he can give her a good chase, just for fun. <laughs> At Giles' Willow finds the Fjarl demon in the books. It can be killed by Silver, so Buffy grabs Giles' letter opener. Riley gets a call that the demon attacked Walsh and then got into Giles' car. Buffy figures out that if a Fjarl demon steals a car, he must be under the control of someone else. Spike and Giles go to the bar to find where Ethan Rain is staying. Buffy and Riley find a trail to Ethan's hotel as well. Riley tells Buffy that Walsh said to leave Buffy behind, but Buffy's having none of it. She's going to kill that demon. On the way to the hotel, the initiative starts chasing Spike and Giles, and Giles offers Spike more money to create a diversion while he runs to the hotel. He gets there and starts to thrash Ethan when Buffy comes in and fights Demon Giles. She stabs him with the letter opener, but either it's not really Silver or Giles isn't really a Fjarl demon. Either way, it doesn't kill him, but she gets a look in his eyes and... Oh God, Giles! Oh God, Giles! Giles! I'm so, I'm so sorry. Please don't die. Ethan reverses the spell and makes Giles Giles again, and Riley takes Ethan into military custody. Buffy and Riley talk about her being stronger than he is, and he can't live with that, so he tells her that he'll train up and then take her down because his masculinity is just that fragile. Later, at Giles's, he has a fatherly talk with Buffy about Riley and the initiative. And at the initiative, Walsh has, I guess you could call it a motherly talk with Riley about Buffy. Then she leaves him and walks through a restricted door marked 314. Oh, shit! 314! Oh, shit. <laughs> 314, baby! All right, Noel! Here we are, a new man. Uh, we get to see Giles as a demon. There's oh lots God. of fun to be had here. How did you like this episode? I love this episode. We could do mm -hmm. an entire Still Pretty just about Spike in this episode I and know. how much I love everything Spike <laughs> in this episode. <laughs> um, He's wonderful. But I love Giles in a fully realized, full-blown group dad mode here. I mean, you know... <laughs> <laughs> He's at home with the feather duster. He's late to right. the demon party. He is the mm -hmm. absolute last to know everything. That mm -hmm. whole scene where he's just, he's so offended that oh Spike my God. knew. <laughs> he just can't. He I cannot. Know, I know. Well, let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and just take a moment to enjoy that moment. Stop, both of you. What, what are you talking about? What, what, what's, what's the initiative? What, um... What on earth does it have to, have to do with Buffy's new boyfriend? You know. I'm sure you know. Riley's <laughs> one of the commandos. What? <laughs> well, that's marvelous, isn't it? <laughs> well, here I am, spent weeks trying to get a single scrap of information about our mysterious demon collectors, and no one bothers to tell me that Buffy's dating one of them? Who else knows? <laughs> no one. No one else knows this. Onion, that's it. <laughs> and Spike. Spike? <laughs> Spike knew? Only the basic stuff. You know, that Riley is a commando and Professor Walsh is in charge. Professor Walsh? That <laughs> fishwife? Oh, my word. 
<laughs> His oh my god total dismay over willow and xander knowing the ins and outs of the initiative and riley's I involvement know. before he knows anything is so delightful and it's spike spike, spike you <laughs> <laughs> And, it's, and that moment where Willow says, uh, 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 and Spike, it's it's the most Espensonian moment like of humor. That is exactly the way that her humor works. And I freaking love it. And the way he's his his business with the flashlight in that right. scene. That's the thing you didn't get to experience that is beautiful yes. about that exchange, because this is an auditory medium yes. that we're in but he's like interrogating them with his flashlight he's he got the like, flashlight that's their light it yeah. up to their faces who else knew you know it's so great it's so great and he's so yeah. he's he's so in this space of feeling like totally ir- like irrelevant and disconnected yes. that it makes mm-hmm. it like it's just such great fuel to reignite his on again, off again magical relationship with Ethan Rain, and I love it. So oh much. my God, of I love course, it. I love it. Of course, <laughs> if you are the patriarch to a merry band of metaphysical researchers and apocalypse thwarters, sometimes you wake up with a demon hangover. I mean, you know, it's a risk. It's a <laughs> risk. I mean, everybody knows that. But the thing is, like, you know, everybody knows I love the emergence of full on sweater Giles, depressed unemployed, unsure of his role in the group, and specifically with Buffy, and falling deeper into existential ennui. I absolutely love it. But then you combine that with the reemergence of Ripper. (laughs) Ethan Rain, you have no idea how much thrashing you is going to improve my day. Like, I freaking just love everything about this. And here we are. We've been kind of having these moments where we're sort of addressing, you know, Giles and and his, his, you know, like sweater Giles kind of moving as he gets more depressed his sweaters get bigger and bigger and bigger by the time we get to the you know middle of the season they're hanging down to his knees it's it's really (laughs) really sweet um so I love all of that and then but then when that sadness and that ennui kind of gets a hold of him and then there's Ethan just showing up out of nowhere giving him something he can hit I love it I absolutely love it yeah the there's that that undercurrent of the joy of hitting things in this episode yes. <laughs> there is. There this is. week in it's men <laughs> men this like to hit things <laughs> like it's so <laughs> but but really i mean yeah like okay all right we i mean this week in men we have to talk about Red, right right sure I mean, oh yes i'm absolutely. so sorry <laughs> No, it's okay. Let's go ahead and so, talk about Okay, Riley. so last week, last week, you know, there was an earthquake, but it's mm-hmm. this week that Riley is well and truly shook, as the kids yeah. say. Um, <laughs> and there's some Riley characterization here that I really, really enjoy. You know, we get the oh, yeah? previously on of him saying that Buffy will teach him about women, which is kind of gross. Ugh. But also... Yeah. <laughs> Hold your noises till the end, please. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's no. All like right. it is. I'll shut up until it's my turn to talk. <laughs> that no. That line is kind of gross. And yeah. also, I like the idea that he is open to learning. And here, this poor boy is trying to wrap his head and other parts really around this special girl <laughs> he likes, who is also the Slayer and truly extraordinary Mm -hmm. it's like i you know i suddenly find myself needing to know the plural of apocalypse it's it's apocalypses like the plural of eclipse is eclipses different linguistic roots but still there you go right you know buffy says we have different amounts of experience you know obviously Mm -hmm. we're not being subtle here with the you know comparing numbers of demons slain and numbers of sexual partners but riley says Girls I grew up with could hold their own. And uh, is Riley a feminist? No. Do I wish he were? Absolutely. Do I like the idea that he at least acknowledges the idea of girls being strong and capable? Hell yes. Is that enough? (laughs) No. But have you seen his arms? Those are good arms to have. (laughs) Oh, my God. Those arms. Okay, here's the thing. Look, last week. I'm sorry. Is it it my turn yet? Yeah. (laughs) Okay. All right. Hold on. Just give me a moment to gather myself. Exactly. (laughs) 
So last week, we've got this grossness with, I've got a lot to learn, but you're going to teach me as opposed to, I will learn it, (laughs) you know, as opposed like making it Buffy's responsibility to teach him. And it's also just a gross line. It's just, I hate that whole thing. But this week, this week, when they're fighting and he's like, are you holding back? I'm holding back. And then she hits him while still holding back, by the way, and sends him flying across the room. And he has this whole thing with that. And then he's like, at the end, you know, uh, give me another week to get ready and I'll take you down. I mean, first of all, okay, he might have been joking, but it's still annoying. And, you know, this is crazy. It's a crazy idea, Riley. So just hang in there while I propose this. You could also accept that she's stronger than you and not let that threaten your stupid, fragile fucking masculinity. It's just a thought. Sleep on it. I can't stand him. (laughs) This is the thing. Like, he's good for a little while. He was okay for a little while. But it's this stuff, how threatened he is by the idea that she is stronger than him. It just drives me crazy. So I heard that line as a double entendre. Riley's line, not yours. Um, Okay. because, (laughs) Because Buffy has been flirty about being able to take her earlier in the mm-hmm. episode. I don't know. You mm-hmm. know, maybe I'm just grasping at Riley straws. But there's something here about I mean, we've, we've hmm, hmm. How do I how do I want to say this? How do I want to say this like in the in the least thirsty way possible? Um, <laughs> no, be as be as thirsty as you want. It's 2019. <laughs> A woman can be responsible for her own thirst. It's fine. <laughs> That's right. Own your desire. Smash the patriarchy own by desire, owning your desire. Yes. I have talked previously about how the physical dance of violence between Giles mm-hmm. and Ethan Rain is this kind of sexual thing that they both seem right. to really enjoy hitting mm-hmm. and being hit by each other. And, you know, we have this, like, lovely subtext of their sexual relationship so Buffy and Riley sparring especially with that music that we get Mm -hmm. and the lighting like it's this very kind of like it's a training sequence but also like kind of sexy we've got these spotlights coming down and the grin on his face like he is just having the best time and it's (laughs) definitely like there's definitely that sexual energy there of like yeah all right like we're gonna be physical and we're gonna get sweaty and you know we're gonna wear our comfy pants and it's kind of great (laughs) we're gonna wear our comfy pants Um, those are always sexy well no comfort (laughs) is sexy i'm sorry if you can't wear your comfy pants with your person (laughs) <laughs> all right all you know. right fair enough but we do agree on this though please tell me we at least agree on this she is the truest soul i've ever known i mean what? that's terrible <laughs> right right just like right what <laughs> like right Riley, what what okay as long as as long <laughs> as we're agreed on that i can let it go let's move on to the the quote-unquote sex analog because willow is in the quote-unquote chem lab well, and is that what they're calling it these days i mean yes like there's all right there's yes. a lot of like <laughs> there's a lot of sex analog on this show i mean yeah and i gotta say i gotta say before we move on to willow which i would i would much rather talk about willow and tara than uh buffy and riley <laughs> As much as I love Riley, but when when Buffy kicks him across the room, yes, and he thunks into that mat, and it just <laughs> thunks down on top of him. It's such a great uh, punctuation uh, for uh, that scene, uh, and it's like this giant athletic hard on just withering because he's <laughs> actually hurt in that moment. I love it so much. So you know, all right, all whatever, all right. So, whatever. So, so yes. we- the camera. Are we lab. good? That's all. You know, I need to give you your moment in Riley, I think, every week, just so that you can have. This week in Riley. <laughs> this week in Riley. Ooh. Well. <laughs> Don't you mind no, if I'm I glad... do. I'm glad that you love him because it makes me feel less bad for hating him so much. But okay, let's as long as we're on the topic, though, however, of sexual analogs, Willow in the chem lab. um, Is this the first time because she spent the night, right? She didn't come home the night before. Is this the first time that Willow and Tara spent the night together, do you think? Well, I mean, we don't get a first kiss. We don't get anything for Willow and Tara. No, we don't know exactly when this started. But I mean, she didn't come home all night. Presumably, I mean. 
they were presumably holed up in that room all night in hush, doing some mm. very powerful hand holding. Um, yes. And I've also had canoned, by the way, that there's a lot of sexy times going on during Hush that mm-hmm. there's going to be a Sunnydale baby boom like <laughs> nine to ten months after the gentlemen show up because you know you can't go out at night. Well if you can't talk what else are you going to yeah, do? Yeah you're right? like get with the fooling around so you know right. I just I've just had canon that for you. Um, Alright thank you. Yeah but I mean I mean floating the rose is pretty it's it's pretty hot yeah. right? It's, like, a, it's a nice little euphemism sure. I kind of <laughs> love it. I kind of love it and I especially love that we we enter into this scene from Ethan and Giles, yeah, you know, at the bar being all, you know, we're still a couple of sorcerers. The night is our time, a time for magic. And then they toast to magic. And I'm like, okay, hot. And then we cut to Willow and Tara and Tara's sweet, sweet, romantic dorm room. I know. I love that she has the little fairy lights all over the place. That is, of course, how I decorate my house, too. And I kind of love that aesthetic. Do you also have, like, like black and burgundy drapes and, like, Mm, prints of village girls (laughs) holding hands and dancing in meadows? Like, it is the... it. (sighs) Oh my god! It just makes my heart. I don't have sing. that, but I have the twinkle lights. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, this is this is fiction after all. We have to like dial up the magical romance. Yes, um, very true. You know, and it's, I mean, it's the gayest shit, and I love it so much. <laughs> it's just. We'll start out slow. <laughs> okay. And I'm like, oh, yes, <laughs> let's do this thing. <laughs> and then it's so cute. It's so cute because they close their eyes and hold hands. And then there's this moment of uncertainty where Tara's like, Willow, <laughs> start out slow doing what? And I just, <laughs> I love that because their first interaction was silent and with touch mm-hmm. and this like, intuition and being so in sync with one another psychically and magically that it's almost like they're already at that point in their relationship where they're like where willow's like oh she's you know like in my head with me already and it's just like Mm -hmm. it's so sweet that's so sweet it's very they're very Mm -hmm. sweet and romantic um yeah and then i'm sorry but the way willow describes this spell that they're Mm -hmm. gonna do Yes. Our minds have to be perfectly attuned to work as a single delicate implement. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I mean, it's like, this is some... This is I some... think I have a single delicate implement in my bedside drawer. Is that what she's talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure I have one of those. <laughs> oh, my God. And it should be very pretty. I just Mine is. love <laughs> I'm sorry. I will stop making vibrator jokes. Go ahead. <laughs> hey, I mean, floating the rose is going to be, you know, we're going to float the hey. rose and we're going to pluck the petals off one by one. I'm like, yes, please. I don't know what it is, but like, do it to me. <laughs> it well, sounds I mean, flowers, gay. Let's do but it. <laughs> flowers are kind of like, you know, Georgia O'Keeffe, right? You know, uh-huh. even though Georgia O'Keeffe has long said that her flowers are not, you know, just big vaginas, like y- death of the author. Like, everybody sees a vagina. There's a vagina there. Um, I think flowers have long been. I mean, what is it? Giving him my flower? You oh, know, God. like, is, was oh, one of the most terrible euphemisms gonna used. They're going to deflower each thing. other. Holy de-flower shit. Deflower yeah. someone? Yeah. Yes. Like, yeah. they deflowered each other. Like, I think that the fact that this is a rose metaphor and a flower metaphor makes this a very clear analog for sex. And we've been using magic as an analog for sex, at least in this season. Of course, later on, we'll use it as an analog for drugs because magic is the magical analog. You can apply it to anything. Right. It'll mean whatever you want in the moment. Um, but the... right now it means it means super gay sex, which I love. I think that's yes. fantastic. Magic is gay um, sex. So I like I mean, it and an gay sex is magic. Like, let me just clear that up right now. In case... <laughs> for anybody who has For anybody who might be curious. Well, we'll let you know. Gay sex is magic. I mean, I speak only for myself. Um, But yeah, I mean, and, you know, all like 
all joking aside, well, most joking mm-hmm. aside, I mean, a single <laughs> red rose is pretty, mm-hmm. that's he- pretty heavy on the symbolism. I mean, yeah. a rose being the symbol of Venus, you know, goddess mm-hmm. of love. There's mm-hmm. the whole, like, a single red rose as a sign of um, devotion and passion for a mm-hmm. potential lover. I mean, how many Valentine's Day teddy bears are holding that like single red red. it's the it's iconic for a reason like it says a very (laughs) specific thing um yes and here we are like making it we're gonna magically float it in the air which you know of course Mm -hmm. we are right you know because flying (laughs) well all right all right 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 so flying in you know many traditions of witchcraft is actually related to uh sex like naked sexy times is it really yes it really is oh my god did you ever read i wrote a book where i (laughs) I had no idea do you remember the flyers in x and the single girl no where i wrote a book (laughs) okay there was it was this family of women and they referred to um, to the men that they would take in for like a one night stand and kick on out, and they called them flyers, the Hot. one night stands. I had no idea yeah. that flying was a was a magical analog for sex. See, this is the thing. This is why death of the author, because even the author doesn't sometimes know what they're pulling. Well, okay, <laughs> but but here's the thing yeah. about I mean, death of the author, yes, but also like terroir, right? If there's yeah. a symbol mm-hmm. that gets repeated over and over again in the art and the movies mm-hmm. and the television that you consume as a creative person you're like yeah but i had no conscious yeah, idea but... i mean it's possible i was just translate that's the thing that's why stories reflect us back at ourselves right. because you pick up on things you don't even realize you're picking up on exactly. but i think that's so fascinating exactly so sorry but... i didn't mean to make it all about no. me but you know it's all about me right it's all about you <laughs> it's all about you hey but no Nothing like but a little daily solipsism <laughs> But I feel like it is relevant because, you know, I think I've said this, I I have definitely said this before, that that part of any sort of critical discourse or even Mm non-critical discourse, you know, fan discourse about any entertainment property, we bring Mm -hmm. all of ourselves and our experience to it. Absolutely. So, you know, we're going to get into, we're going to get into one of my favorite favorite ladies in just a minute and it's like you know like you reflect on like all right well why do I like the things I like and it's because Mm -hmm. you bring part of the reason is that you bring all of yourself and all of your experience and all of your you know little right which is why it's okay if someone hates what you love yes. or loves what you hate, people get all freaked out because they're like, everybody has to have the same opinion. Like, for instance, let's say Muppets, right? Oh, Muppets just are the goddamn instance. worst. <laughs> for instance, just for example, let me just say, you know, unequivocally, Muppets are the goddamn worst. Like, I, I hate Muppets. Everybody knows I hate Muppets. And every time I say I hate Muppets on a podcast, I spend three days on Twitter getting barraged with Muppet gifts. So go ahead. Come at me. I can handle it. But long story short, they are the worst. However, <laughs> I hate them for reasons of I don't even know. Like I can ex- I can tell you a million reasons why I hate Muppets, but it's just how I feel. It's just how they they grate on my nerves like you would not believe. Now, that could possibly go back to a troubled childhood. I have no idea. <laughs> whatever. I watched a lot of Muppets when I was a kid. I don't care for them now. Um, so whatever it is, I'm bringing my experience to it. But when I say I hate Muppets, people freak the fuck out because they're like, how can you hate Muppets? Oh, my God. It's my job to now make you love Muppets. You're not going to make me love them. You're going to make me hate them even more. But it's OK. And people who love Muppets, I love it. That's great. They can love them enough for me so that I can hate them as much as I want. And vice versa. When people hate what I love, like, that's fine. I don't have any problem with that, you know. Um So I think that like there's something in our need for everybody to see things the way that we see things. There's some kind of like human psychological need. And it makes us sometimes, I think, insecure when we hold an opinion that somebody else disagrees with, you know. And I think that probably the healthier way to look at it and definitely the happier way to look at it is that I hate this thing or I love this thing. 
you know, and somebody else likes it or doesn't has absolutely no relevance to how it makes me feel. That's my experience. That's how it is. And nobody like people don't have to agree with you in order for your experience and your read to be valid. So go ahead, Noel. Tell me how much you love Maggie Walsh. <laughs> 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 well, with an end Please like love that, her enough for both of us because I, I super it. hate her. Well, Good. yeah. And I mean, like, this is the thing. Like, our our individual cultural and pop cultural touchstones become mm -hmm. kind of our pantheons, you know? Yeah. Like, we have mm -hmm. these, these archetypes and these... Um, I don't know. I mean, it feels very... It feels very much like a religious... Like a religion adjacent sort of a feeling about, you know, this feeling that that people, myself included, get about mm -hmm. the things that we love, the properties that we love and the, the archetypes that we love. Mm -hmm. I love I I love really mean women. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is that why we're such good friends? <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you after class, Rich. <laughs> Ooh, hello. <laughs> but I love I okay. This is this is where my feelings about Professor Walsh start to get a little bit more complicated because I mm -hmm. mean yeah, I mean she's definitely like leaning into the whole evil bitch monster from hell thing. Mm -hmm. Um but, you know, like, we use the latest in scientific technology and state-of-the-art weaponry, and you, if I understand correctly, poke them with a sharp stick. Oh, my God. Fuck you, lady. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, I love I this. I hate her. I love this because we're doing <laughs> so great. Yeah. This is why we podcast together, because we hate different things. Um, I know, and it makes it fun. I like it. <laughs> but we're doing this whole, like, militaristic structure and technology versus mm -hmm. cooperation, nature, and magic thing. And that always yes. gets me in my feels. I love that so much. I think so that's much. great. Sure. This belief mm -hmm. that if you have the latest technology, you must mm -hmm. be getting the best results, which we know right. from so many areas of our right. lives and experiences is not true. And it's here it is, true. you know, mm -hmm. reflected in this fantasy scenario. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and the numbers don't lie. Buffy has mm -hmm. literally 10 times the dustings and demon slayings that Riley has. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a point of vulnerability for Walsh in that she can't fathom Buffy's effectiveness without access to an underground tinfoil terrarium. Like, she doesn't... All right. I... <laughs> like... I'm going to throw a flag on that one. You're going to be like, mm, I, don't, mm. I don't think in any way that this makes her vulnerable. I think that what she's doing is she clearly sees her way of doing things as being superior. And if I understand correctly, you poke them with a sharp stick. Yeah, fuck you, lady. Um, also... <laughs> Um, there's no vulnerability I, that I see at all in Walsh there. She is not threatened at all by Buffy. She's looking at Buffy and thinking, I am so much better than you, and I'm going to take you down the same way I take everybody down whenever I have a conversation with them because I'm an asshole. So that's, you know, I'm just going to, I'm throwing the red flag on this idea that she's vulnerable because of that, because I do not see any vulnerability in Maggie Walsh. But go ahead, continue. I, take see, it. The, I see the teeniest little flicker of vulnerability. And maybe this is my, like, I tend to lean into stories where there's that sort of sympathy for the devil kind of angle. Like, I love uh -huh. the... I love the evil character who's just doing their best, you guys. <laughs> Do you believe they're She's doing their doing best? best? <laughs> Sorry. That's a, that's a big, strong yes reference. If you haven't listened to that, don't worry about it anyway. <laughs> but if you haven't listened to Big Strong Yes, why are you here? No, that's not fair. That's not fair. But It's an entirely different kind of podcast. But, yes. <laughs> but I mean, I come down hard on Team Walsh when Giles, you know, comes into her office 
I, like, because what the fuck, Giles? Like, what is he? Okay, even... you come down hard on the side. You are on Team Walsh, right? <laughs> okay, that's what I'm saying. Oh, I'm sorry. I am Syntax so is team hard, Giles you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to. I just want to make sure it's clear that what you're saying is that you are with Maggie. Oh yes. When Giles comes into her office, yes, like giant foam, okay. you know, initiative. We're number one okay. finger. All like right. I'm right there. Yes. Okay. Like, okay. I don't know. All right. I get this vibe from from Giles that he is feeling kind of emasculated because Buffy called Maggie smart. I don't. I, well, no, I, like I mean, it. he came to her office because he was looking for Buffy and then he's just looking for Buffy and she's an asshole to him. And so he engages with her like the fact that he goes to her office. And I think that maybe, you know, he wanted to meet her like she's, you know, a very like important person to Buffy and Buffy likes her and all this stuff. And then maybe he just wanted to meet her. And then she turned out to be an asshole. (laughs) So I don't know. I mean, she definitely like shuts his friendliness shit down. Like she has no time. She has no time for this man. He's being friendly. God and, forbid he well, should come in and be polite. I mean, I have had some bad experiences with men being friendly coming oh. into my space. <laughs> so. Uh, 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 okay. Well, everybody has, but he's not that kind of friendly when he's yeah, coming but, in. He's just being polite. Uh, he's just British. <laughs> I don't know. And you know how I feel about that now. <laughs> 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 Hashtag de- <laughs> decolonize your desire. What is it that we're working on now? Right. I love it. <laughs> this is a growth opportunity, right. is what I'm saying. Um, a growth opportunity. <laughs> but when Charles. Nobody right, can right. be attracted to British men ever again. No, that is not what I said. Although. <laughs> no. <laughs> Although. Oh my God! Oh Look, my if if word. being proper and appropriate means I have to give up my underpants feelings for Giles, then I don't care. If loving Giles is wrong, let me be wrong. <laughs> I don't want to be right. I don't want to be right. That's if right. loving Giles is wrong. I don't want to be right. But <laughs> all right. But when when Giles refers to Buffy as a girl, Walsh mm-hmm. comes back with woman, which I appreciate. Yes. And then Giles mm-hmm. has this douchey moment of woman, of course, how wrong of me to choose my own words. Fuck you, Giles. All right, all right, all right, all right. I'm going to say co-signed. Co-signed really fucking hard because yes, that was an asshole thing to say. But just because Giles is being a little bit of an asshole doesn't make Walsh any less of a huge fucking asshole. But yes, you're absolutely right. I 100% support it. And when Giles said that, I was like, oh no, that's not good. Oh no, Giles, no. No. (laughs) But I mean, like, he very much is the dad to, Mm -hmm. to the group. And then like Walsh gets it Walsh gets him in the feels and I don't I mean yes who I feel I feel bad about loving it but I kind of love it you know she says I'll tell Buffy her friend was looking for her I'll tell Buffy her friend was looking for her and then we get that shady rattlesnake noise in the background that's so good (laughs) yes so Mm -hmm. yes yes Walsh is starting to rock her evil bitch monster of death. Look, is it evil bitch monster from from hell? Evil bitch, evil bitch monster. It's either from hell or of death. I thought it was of death. But I think I'm not it sure. is of death. I think I said it incorrectly yeah. earlier. Um, ah, whatever. It's anyway, the same basic thing. <laughs> I like it. I like her oh. being secure <laughs> in her own uh-huh. position, and she is not going to be cowed by some man who used to be Buffy's high school librarian. Okay, 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 okay. (laughs) Being secure in your position, you do not need to be an asshole and take other people down in order to be secure in your own position. And the thing is that men have been doing exactly that shit to women forever. And if you gender flip this situation, this interaction, if a man spoke to a woman this way, I would fucking want to slap him. So I'm kind of like, I don't know. And granted, when you gender flip, you also flip the power differential and the historical context of men who often talk to women this way. And I know because I was in an office with one of my bosses 
once who spoke to me that way. And I was like, what the actual fuck just happened there? You know, um, so like I've been in that position where somebody spoke to me like that because I was a woman. Like it was clear because I was a woman. He was a like notorious misogynist. But anyway, this isn't about me. That's over in BSY. But anyway, long story short, <laughs> like I'm all for women not being nice and accommodating, but she is deliberately being hurtful and blaming him as a weak male role model for Buffy's problems. And she knows exactly what the fuck she's doing right there. And it's evil and mean and cruel and unnecessary. It is one thing for her to not be like super sweet and accommodating with him, you know, but it is another thing to like deliberately and for no real reason, you know, like just tr- take him out of the knees like that. It's shitty. Okay, I have mean mommy issues. That's all I, that's my only defense. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no it's, baby it's okay you can see it differently it's fine no it's, no, it's completely <laughs> shitty and 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 also i like it is my like mm-hmm. it's kind okay. of it's like the whole spike you know i'm evil remember you know like, i'm I evil just, remember I, I dig it i like it i, I like it's, it it's okay baby love what you love is the whole motto of Chipper. so i'm not trying i'm not trying to take away your love i'm just explaining to you why i hate fucking muppets so anyway one thing one thing that i do love though in this episode is ethan rain because he is so wait unbelievably wait wait wait, wait. Cute. weren't we supposed huh? to do the patreon ask right here oh it's in this shit yeah, I almost forgot. I got a voicemail from Kelly this morning. About the Patreon ask? Yeah, actually, kind of. Clive is at her apartment, apparently. What? No one tells me anything. I I just got it this morning. And now you know how Giles feels. Well, so play the voicemail, Rich. Okay, okay, I've got it right here. Lonnie, it's Kelly. Clive got off the bus in St. Louis and somehow found my house. He's here. If I'd come back to New York, they'd find me again. Zip it, Clive. He says they want something, and I am talking, Clive. Honestly, Lonnie, we need to talk about your issues with men. Have you ever thought about dating a nice southern guy? I mean, if accents are your thing, what? Fine. You've got 30 seconds. Lonnie, I apologize for anything I may have... Right. This episode of Still Pretty is brought to you by the generous patrons who support Chipperish Media through Patreon.com. These people make it possible to keep all Chipperish shows free and ad-free so that you may enjoy them without interruption and without being urged to subscribe to a box meal service or buy a mattress. Supporting Chipperish Media allows us to continue to make the shows you love, like Still Dead about Angel the Series, Listen Up A-Holes about the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Allgasm about Explosive Inspiration, Metaphors Be With You about Star Wars, and How Story Works, a free college-level course in narrative theory. Visit patreon.com slash chipperish to find out how, for just a couple dollars a month, you can keep Chipperish Media creating all the podcasts you love. And that part right there. Oh, yes. Also, for patrons giving $5 a month and up, you gain access to the private Facebook group and monthly videos from the Chipperish hosts. Are you happy now? Do I look happy? Okay, now, Lonnie. Bless your heart. Go over there and be quiet. Wait! I didn't get a chance to tell her that I... I'll tell her. Lonnie, this dude says that some British chick named Bryony is coming after him, and I think you better let me handle this. Bryony, if you're out there, I'm bringing Clive to the St. Louis Arch at 1 o'clock on Saturday. What?! Take him, leave him, kill him. I don't care, but this ends now. You're going to return the money Lonnie paid you in advance for the ads you did not produce, and we are done fucking around. Lonnie, baby, I got this. And the next man you date, well, Noelle and I get veto power, okay? Love you, baby. Bye. If you would just let me talk to her. (laughs) Oh, my God. All right, so I guess, like, Kelly's handling it now, and I don't have to worry about it, which is good. So, I don't know. You want to talk about Ethan Rain? (laughs) Let's talk about a different British man who keeps popping up inconveniently. (laughs) Okay. All right. Ethan Rain. Ethan Rain, my favorite pansexual sorcerer imp, is back. I love it. Oh, my God. I love him so much. I love the evil monologuing, especially with it being interrupted. (laughs) Such a great, such a great twist on the evil monologue. Oh, yes. what you don't know. Yes. <laughs> oh, We've bugger, done that I thought you times. Times. <laughs> I know, it's so great. So been, he's been rehearsing yes. that. It's so yes. great. He just loves... Oh, he has. He loves to hear himself monologue. And I really, really enjoy the way Ethan kind of taunts Giles, but also tempts him, you yes. know, like to magic. Yes. Like, let's just, you know, 
it's great. And there's something to quote just, unquote magic. I mean, magic. there's like a there's a deep sexual vibe between Giles and Ethan, don't oh, you think? I mean, are right? you kidding me? I mean, of course there is. <laughs> <laughs> they so enjoy beating each other up. It's so great. They, mm-hmm. I mean, really, you have no it's... idea how much thrashing you is going to improve my day. <laughs> I mean, come on. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> That's right. It's some good stuff. And Ethan is so great. I love the way he just comes and introduces mischief. You know, he's just there for chaos. And it's really, it makes him so much fun. I mean, the thing is, like, one of the things with villains is that you always want them to have, like, a villain who's just tying a girl to the train tracks for what reasons? For what reasons? Why do you, why would you tie somebody to a train track? What is that about? Because why you're does your evil. mustache curl up at the ends like that? I don't understand. Because you are evil. You know, like evil for evil's sakes. Like like Ronan the Accuser in Guardians of the Galaxy. Like just be an evil for evil's sake without any real characterization behind it um, is, you know, is boring. And um, I mean, functionally in a narrative, as long as they're blocking the protagonist, I mean, they work functionally. They're just not that interesting. But there is something about about mischief for mischief's sake, about chaos for chaos's sake, about the kind of trickster energy that Ethan Rain has that actually really does work on a lot of levels. And I'm not sure why evil for evil's sake doesn't, but mischief for mischief's sake does. But it just does. I freaking love it. I, I love because, that trickster energy. Yeah. Well, I think because the trickster is having fun. I think evil yeah. for evil's sake... You don't get a lot of sense of like joy from the mustache twirling villain. Right. Right. But the the villain who is just like, yeah, I'm gonna turn my friend and ex lover into a demon. I'm like, just gonna that's, stir some shit up. Fun. Yeah. It's like I'm gonna do it because yeah. it's fun, because it's mm-hmm. funny. Because then I get to stay and gloat. But of course, of course, that's my downfall. Right? That's my like, downfall. I always stay to gloat. I love him. Like, I love that level of self-awareness. But like, he yeah. is playful. Ethan yeah. Rain is playful. And the the tie the girl to the train tracks villain is not usually playful. No, that's it's, true. I'm just, I'm being and evil that's the because thing is I'm that the there's, bad guy. Right. And that there's the motivation behind it. Like, if the motivation is that it's a good goddamn time. That you're having fun with it, you know, and he's also not doing things that are particularly evil. I mean, there was the, you know, the Halloween costumes was fun. Band candy was fun. Turning Mm -hmm. Giles into a demon is a good goddamn time. Like he's just having (laughs) fun. And yes, it causes a lot of chaos and it creates danger, but that's not his primary motivation. And I think that that's why he's such a good time. God, I want to write a trickster villain. Now oh, I want to write man. a trickster villain. I just there's so much fun. Oh man. I need I need your take on an Ethan Rain type. I like, would really love to magical do that. tricks. Because the magic element makes it great yes. too. Yes, it does. I think the magic element makes it I mean, it makes it trickier for sure. Mm-hmm. Especially because mm-hmm. we know um at this point that magic does not work how you think it works like it's not like you think you're in charge you think you're driving and no you're not you're not not. you think you know what's going on but you don't know what's Mm -hmm. going on Mm -hmm. (laughs) speaking of knowing what's going on because that's my excellent excellent segue and i think always when you have a bad segue the best way to handle that is to put a lampshade on the bad segue but anyway i want to talk about spike (laughs) So Spike in this episode, I mean, okay, I love the odd couple pairings. I love when you take two characters who don't ordinarily interact a whole lot and you kind of shove them together by circumstance and it just is so much fun. And Spike and Giles together are just freaking delightful. I love that Spike knows and understands Fjarl. <laughs> It's and so I'm supposed great. to help you out of the evilness of my heart. I'm evil, people. Like, I love the way he keeps telling everybody he's evil. Everybody loves him and they can't help but love him. <laughs> he has to keep reminding people that he is evil. It's so great. He is so great. But he's also, I love the Spike who is of the world. I talk about this yes. all the time, too. But it's mm-hmm. so beautifully done here where he's moving mm-hmm. out of Xander's basement and he's just gonna like take the radio because you know he might want to listen to the radio in his new crypt and then of course Anya's like well 
what about a fridge for blood? And he's like, well, hang on. <laughs> like, <laughs> You've got a point there. Wait a minute. Like, Spike is definitely, definitely yes. the vampire who ha- who would want a crypt with electricity and running water oh, yeah. because he oh, likes yeah. the world. And he we'll see this. that he manages to make that happen because in a couple of seasons, he's going to have a crypt that has all these, that has the electricity to run the television. You know, yeah. like, I mean, he's, you know, he, yeah. there's no reason not to not to live like a modern vampire. You know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I like money. How much? I like, like money. <laughs> oh, I like money. He likes money. <laughs> it's so great. It's just it's so great. I love when Spike is like, oh, God, you when wait. I love when Giles is like, oh, God, perfect end to the perfect day with Spike. And he gets ready to fight. And then Spike recognizes him and knows it's him and is just loving the fact that he's been turned into a Fjarl demon. <laughs> and is so, so like, not bothered by it. Like, right. You know, when Giles, yeah. when Giles starts snarling and growling, Spike is just yes. like, he's over everyone else's bullshit, including this Fjarl demon whose mm-hmm. car he's sort of driving oh. it's so funny it is so funny we I can know i mean i could just say for an hour how much i love their interactions you yes. know he's like you picked up a tail <laughs> just a little <laughs> one it hurts when i sit you know it's like <laughs> these details these details like the yes. detail of spike when giles passes by spike in the graveyard spike has a mm-hmm. tape measure he's measuring yes. the crypt he's like <laughs> He's preparing it's for his best. move. It's it's so the best. funny. It is so <laughs> wonderful. So what are vampires? What's what's the Home Depot for vampires? Oh God, that's an excellent question. Like, where do you? What? Man, yeah, I don't know. Vampires don't know. in this vampires in this world manage to acquire all kinds of things that I'm like, but but how? How? Well, I because mean, I think they, I think typically the the really super evil ones just kill people and take their shit. Like I think hmm. that's mostly how it works. All right, all right. But I mean, now we know that Spike is coming into some money but how, because he's... how did Angel? How did right. Angel oh. have these nice little cement apartments everywhere? <laughs> I, I Angel makes no sense to know. me. Angel makes zero sense. Angel makes sense. absolutely no, no sense. sense. He has he's very high standards. He's not evil, so he's not robbing anybody, but he doesn't have a day job or even a night job. So like <laughs> That he gets actually paid for. Angel is a Angel is a question. Angel is a conundrum, but he's not here right now. So we'll go ahead and continue talking about Spike. Um, I love Spike's like whole thing. I love him kind of being shifted around to find the space where he belongs, you know, in this group. And we're sort of pairing him up, you know, with various people and getting a sense of how he works with the group. Uh, you know, we've had him with Xander for a while. He was with Giles for a while, you know, and now he's back with Giles. And it's just it's really kind of fun seeing him sort of fit uncomfortably but into this space you know and he just has to keep reminding people that he's evil because fans of course love him and we do have a bit of an issue we do have a bit of an issue with fans really loving like seriously problematic men you know like the people (laughs) who loved the ted bundy guy you know and like um and like there was the the show that was on netflix you know where the guy was really super evil and everybody was like oh no i love him and then the actor was like no he's a sociopath you know um so anyway that's a whole other discussion but spike is is part of that phenomenon like these oh yeah like he's really difficult problematic men that that people just freaking love and you have to remind them that they are evil yeah yeah and spike i mean Spike is a is a creepy stalker and a yeah. murderer and like yeah. is encouraging Giles to do harm mm-hmm. and you know is yeah. reminding all of us that he's evil and we love him because he is also like us you know that like yes he wants he's complicated he's vulnerable he can love like there's all sorts of things that he's funny he wants he's a sexy. fridge for his yeah. blood he he yes, just he, he just does. wants fresh blood from the fridge. Right. He likes money, you yeah. know. He he comes away from this he with is presumably of the world. Yeah, three hundred bucks. Yeah. Sure, you know, I'll and get him three hundred dollars yeah. in two thousand is about four hundred and thirty dollars now. So you know, <laughs> not a life changing ah, amount of money ah, for ah, most ah, vampires, ah, but 
I figure like right, but if you're not paying for most yeah. of your stuff, yeah. you know, it gives you it gives you a little something, a little something yeah. you can do. Then little, you don't have to bother robbing somebody. A little pocket money for Spike. A little pocket money. <laughs> sure. But I mean, there you go. You know, and I love I love them being so cranky with each other, Giles mm-hmm. and Spike, and how much they they keep needing each other. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And they yes. so don't want to, you know, Giles, yes. Giles getting Spike to drive him around, you know, but yes. then if you can't find third gear, don't try for third gear. <laughs> and poor Spike. In that terrible, terrible car. I love it when they're like, why would a demon steal a car? And Anya goes, why would a demon, demon steal, steal that, that car? car. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, it's so the, sweet. Yes. All of the, all it's of the so jokes sweet. about Giles's car are just. Are very, very fun. The best. <laughs> the best but spike and giles i would watch that show i would watch the spike or the spike xander giles because i love Mm -hmm. xander and giles and that friction i love giles you know shooing xander and the bike away you know (laughs) kind of take him Mm -hmm. off my hands for a few it's great it's great those three this week in men i like this this triangle I want to see more of it. <laughs> and more it of is. it. It's very, very nice. It's yep. very, very nice. All right. So, Noelle, what are you wearing? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. What am I wearing this week? Let's see mm-hmm. if I can find it in the script. Ah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I knew there was something. Um, so, Willow comes in on Riley and Buffy making out in her yeah. as seen on TV t-shirt which is such a great just like <laughs> her t-shirts are great. I love cheeky wardrobe. I really really do. Yes. Um mm-hmm. you know and of course that's a great that's a great t-shirt for her to be wearing in this moment when she's doing this fake out with the Yes. Something came through the came into the rec room and <laughs> vampires don't breathe fire. And that is the most convincing lie that anyone has told on this show, possibly in the history of ever. Like Right. I, yes. I played it up more than she does. She's like, oh no. You know, like it's not right. it's no, not, it seemed like it was very real that there was something, you know, going you know, on. Yeah, it was pretty good. It's not the we're doing crime here. You don't sneak up during crime. Like it's there. <laughs> she really sells it. Um, yeah. And then Willow wears this stars and rainbow applique sweater for a lot of this episode. Mm-hmm. And it. OK, first of all, like it's a it's a big gay pride rainbow sweater with stars over the nipples and it's like mm-hmm. rainbow but it looks like it's frowning and it makes Aww. me so sad it makes me so i'm like oh willow like like no it's okay like like you're right. you know like your shiny happy gay feelings are really okay i just i just want to va- i want to like go into the past and validate uh-huh. validate Aww. willow's gay feelings as expressed in her sad gay sweater um oh which you know sad gay sweater sad gay sweater maybe i'm reading too much into that maybe not but i just i'm just like oh so sweet and i mean giles in ethan's shirt mm-hmm. I... oh yeah oh my god that's the best <laughs> i love narratively appropriate weird costuming or or ridiculous yeah. costuming. I mean, Spike, <laughs> right. last week, Spike mm-hmm. in Xander's clothes is just the yes. best. Yes. The best, the best. Oh, but, my God. Yeah, Giles in Ethan's shirt. There's something just so perfect about that. Well, it's, you know, it's really about identity. And Giles is having such a difficult time finding his own identity. And I mean, what do we, how do we talk about Giles as, you know, his whole crisis of identity in, you know, season four is sweater Giles, yeah. right? You know, like he has this sense. And if, you know, he's wearing this demon, you know, body for a good part of it. <laughs> And then he gets shoved into an Ethan shirt, you know, which, by the way, even though it's not Giles, looks damn good on him. He definitely has that like funky nighttime sorcerer, mm-hmm. groovy 1970s, 1970s yes, vibe. Yeah, absolutely. it's good. Oh, no, it's, I love it. I dig good. it. I dig it so much. It's very good. <laughs> it's very good. But we know for But you're absolutely right. It is about identity. And mm-hmm. he knows that this is not it you know at the end although i love him cheekily saying like 
excuse me, I'm going to go watch them manhandle him into a van when he finishes. <laughs> it's just like such a great little oh punctuation God, mark on that I know. relationship. It's so great. I love it. Yeah, I absolutely love it. I love the delight with which he says that. <laughs> Because sex it's and really, violence really and magic all go together, you guys. It's like they a thing that we're doing do. on this show. I know. All right. So, Noelle, I think it might be time for this. Oh, not with a girl pal, babe. <laughs> Tell me about your girl power moment of the week. I really hope that someone is keeping score and you know is marking down every time the girl power moment of the week for me is Willow. Um, because here we go again. Willow. It's so yeah. there's so mm-hmm. much Willow. But she says to Buffy, you can't walk around pretending you're less than you are. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I love you so much, Willow, even I though, know. you know, people give the advice they need to hear, Miss. I was in the chem lab by myself floating a rose. Like, <laughs> right. Well, there's also things that are personal. You know, yes. I don't think she's pretending to be less. I think that she's got a personal thing that she's just not ready to share. So I'm like, OK, with that. But at the same time, yes, absolutely. But there's I mean, there is a level of discomfort yeah. there that I think we'll see yeah. as we go forward. And it's like and it's very sweet and and very tender. But yeah, yeah. come on, girl, you can do it. Willow. <laughs> you can do it, baby. You can come out. It'll be fine. It'll be good. It'll be good. You got your sweet, Aww. magical love story happening. And I love it. I know it's the best. Float that rose, baby. All right. So, Noelle, what is your favorite part? The three beat. The car stealing three beat. Willow. (laughs) It stole Jazz's car. Xander. Why would a demon steal a car? Anya. Why would a demon steal that car? It's so good. It is. It's a terrible, terrible car. It is a terrible car. Terrible car, but a great line. And we get the wonderful ridiculousness. Mm-hmm. of Demon Giles and Vampire Spike <laughs> driving around town <laughs> in Giles' car. Oh, my God. It's so fun. All right, Lonnie, what's your favorite part? Uh, you know what? I think it's just Ethan. I think it's Ethan Rain and the chaos and the mischief and the fun, just how much fun he brings to it. You know, I love Ethan and Giles getting drunk, talking about, you know, couple of old mystics you know um it's just it's really it's nice it's always fun i love when ethan rain comes back and i think mostly ethan rain has been written by jane espenson oh right band candy i don't think she wrote halloween but she brought him back for band candy she brought him back again i think jane espenson is the one who does ethan rain like the most justice he's just wonderful when she writes him i love it If you enjoyed this conversation and would like to join in, come find us on Twitter. Lonnie is at Lonnie Diane Rich, and I am at Noelle Aloud, and the hashtag is still pretty. This episode of Still Pretty was brought to you by the Chipperish media producers who support us on Patreon at the power producer level. These people are the reason why Still Pretty is coming to you free and ad-free right now. So thank you to our November producers, Jonathan, Noel, Kristen, Alyssa, Erica, Shelley, Alice, Abigail, and Sarah. And this week's special message for our power producers, I've known corpses with a fresher smell. In fact, I've been one. To find out how you, too, can support Chipperish Media, visit patreon.com slash chipperish. Other ways to show your support, write a review on Apple Podcasts, tell your friends about the show, or by trying it again without the stutter. We will be back next time with The Eye in Team, the 13th episode of Season 4. Until then, brilliant. Now, isn't this more fun than kicking my ass? No. Oh, it's more fun for me. (laughs) 